Hello, everyone. How are we doing? Can everyone hear me okay? Hello, sweet. Hey, Wombat. Hey, Hugo. We doing okay? We've been to one of these before. Not bad, sweet. Hello. <laughs> oh, it's loads of you. Hey. So are we all doing AS physics, A2 physics, just here for the ride? <laughs> Anyone doing neither? Oh, yes, physics, sweet. Are we enjoying it? Do we like the course? First year level, nice. It was demanding. Yeah, I remember when I started, um, when I started A level physics, I found it very hard at the start, actually. Ah, hello from Britain. Exam on Friday. Okay, good luck. Which, uh, which part? On tomorrow. Oh, sweet. Good luck. Um, I didn't think that second year was much harder than first year, from what I remember. Um, I did. I found like first year to be a jump from GCSE, definitely. Um, but I didn't find second year as much of a jump from first year. But that was just me. I think I just liked the second year topics more. I'm trying to think. So for me, second year topics were things like, well, it's pretty much the same now. Like I got on well with all the particle physics stuff. Um, in the first year, I really struggled with the circuit stuff. Doing You can't do more than your maximum. Oh, good luck for the momentum test. So today we are doing projectile motion. Um, so we'll do, it's basically, it's a special case of doing SUVAT stuff and then a more complicated special case of doing SUVAT stuff. So SUVAT stuff, uh, by that I mean the, the equations that we're allowed to use when we know we've got constant acceleration. Our particular constant acceleration in this case is going to be gravity. Um, and then what we'll do at the end is do some cheeky stuff where we have to think about SUVAT equations in two dimensions. And that's what projectiles are. Uh, A-levels, I did maths, physics, further maths, uh, chemistry, and... Uh, music, which was a bit of a change from the others. It's not chocolate tea, it's just black coffee. It's probably a bit late in the day for it, really. I didn't actually know chocolate tea was a thing. It actually sounds great. Uh, this session's still full, so we'll get started in a sec. Uh, so, yeah, uni, I went to Oxford for my undergrad. I did a master's at UCL. 
And now I'm back at Oxford again. Um, but that's for later stuff. Hello from Britain. <laughs> nice to meet you. All right, let's do this thing. It's going to be good. Okay, so with any luck, you can all see my screen. Is that true? Are we seeing, uh, when I say see my screen, I mean see a title page that says A-level physics projectile motion. Perfect. Okay. Let's do this. Um, okay, so today is about projectile motion. Uh, the way this is going to work is I'm going to do... Uh, um, a kind of a, a kind of a recap of the then we'll talk a bit about gravity in general. Then we'll try and get through some questions. So this stuff today should be for all exam boards. Everyone wants you to know. Everyone wants you to know gravity stuff. I think all the exam boards want you to go as far as doing two D stuff and projectiles. Uh, you may just want to check your textbook for that. Uh, I expect so. Uh, okay, so let's actually. Let's let's do this thing. So about me, I'm Matt W. Um, I look less tired there. Um, I was less tired there. Um, so yeah, heading physics at Snap Revise. Um, uh, right now, I've come back to Oxford for PhD. Um, and yeah, I've been treating physics for a long time, and I'm keen to do some more. So let's do it. Uh, just so you know, at the end, um, if you follow us on Instagram and share a picture. Uh, of this web class on your story. Uh, someone's going to get a free account and there'll be a coupon code at the end for everyone. So everyone can get a discount if they want to log into Snap Revise and start using uh, some of the courses that we've put up. Good. So exam boards covered should be AQA at Excel and, um, oh, so tired. OCR, I see one. <laughs> I knew it was there. Okay, so the objectives today are to understand the concept of free fall. That's basically when we're accelerating under gravity and only gravity. Uh, describe objects under free fall using acceleration due to gravity. Good. And this is going to be all about SUVAT stuff. And then we're going to ex extend SUVAT to not only being in one direction or another, but being kind of using pairs of SUVAT equations, one for a vertical direction and one for a horizontal direction. And that's projectile motion. Okay, let's do this. Um, so what do we need to know already? I need to know the SUVAT equations. So can anyone tell me uh, any of the SUVAT equations? Let's see if we can try and get all four of them. Um, well, it's more than four, but let's try and get four so that we get a complete set. And tell me when you're allowed to use SUVAT equations, because that's a really important piece of information. Good, V equals U plus AT. I like that. V equals U plus A T. If you rearrange that equation, it's actually the definition of acceleration. Good. Okay, sweet. Yeah, really nice. Um, I think we're missing one. So V equals U plus A T. Perfect. Um, S equals U T plus a half A T squared. What do all these symbols mean? Good, absolutely right. We're only allowed to use these equations when we have constant acceleration. So this number here, the acceleration, must be constant. Acceleration, constant. If you don't have a constant acceleration, you're not allowed to use this stuff. Good, S is the displacement, and S is equal to UT plus a half a t squared good v is the final velocity nice t is the time of course good okay i think i've seen everything i need so v squared is equal to u squared plus 2 a s and you're going to want to commit these to memory and finally s is equal to u plus v v over two times t that's kind of like saying the distance traveled is given by taking the average of the initial and the final velocities 
and then multiplying by time. Good, yeah, absolutely. Perfect, so that's the kind of one dimensional stuff. Then when we expand to two dimensions, we're gonna to need to take um, vectors which are in weird directions and treat their vertical and their horizontal bits separately. So if I have some kind of a vector, I don't know what kind of quantity it represents yet. Could be a distance, could be a velocity, could be an acceleration. Those are all vectors, S, V, A, U. They're all vectors. But let's say I just have some vector with a length L. And let's say it's an angle theta to the horizontal. How can I find its vertical component? How can I find how much of it points upwards? Uh, yeah, so I could draw an arrow on everything because there's going to be, because we're going to write so many of these and they're always vectors, I'm going to avoid it here. Um, but yeah. Good. Okay, absolutely right. This is a Sokotoa question. Um, so sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, and that indeed means that this length here, the opposite bit, is given by L times sine theta. Perfect. And what if I wanted to know the horizontal bit? L cos theta, yeah, perfect stuff. Good, yeah, cos it. Perfect. L cos theta. Perfect. Okay. I think we're in a good place. So that's the stuff you need to know for today. Uh, some people were asking about what exam boards we're going through. Uh, so here's the spec points covered for AQA. Uh, here's the spec points covered for OCR. And here are the spec points covered for Edexcel. The Edexcel ones are often a lot more concise, <laughs> but actually uh, <laughs> contain the same points. Okay. So let's do this. Freefall. Uh, we'll come to defining what freefall is. First of all, we're going to describe a couple of experiments. Now, uh, you could call them experiments. You could call them thought experiments. Uh, we've written here on the left that Galileo dropped two balls of equal mass from the Leaning Tower of Pisa to show something. Um, so question one is, is, what did he do this to show? <laughs> and question two, which will give the answer is, uh, <laughs> did he actually do this? The answer is probably not. This was actually probably a thought experiment. But so I'll, I'll rephrase the question. What would happen if you drop two balls of equal mass from the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa? Sorry, not equal mass, different mass. Let me write that again. Different mass. My apologies. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you're right. <laughs> Always awesome, awesome to ask if acceleration is related to mass. Uh, the point is that it's actually not related. Um, so you can imagine dropping two balls of different masses from the Leaning Tower of Pisa or from anything, you would find that they would hit the ground at the same time. So this is a big surprise. So I take two balls, one is heavier than the other, but it won't hit the ground sooner. Even though one's heavier than the other, they will actually hit the ground at the same time. And this is kind of, this seems a bit unintuitive to us. So you can imagine dropping two balls of different mass from the top of a tower. Um, and what you would show is that they hit the ground at the same time. Now, we know what you're thinking. There are objects you could drop um, if you're holding them that would hit the ground at different times. For example, if I dropped a piece of paper and I dropped a bowling ball, the bowling ball would hit the ground sooner. The point is that if I have two things of kind of the right shape so that I don't have to care about air resistance, then what gravity does is pull them both down at the same rate. 
The only reason why a bowling ball actually would hit the ground sooner than a piece of paper is because of air resistance. And everything we're going to be doing today is about ignoring air resistance. So you're absolutely right to say that um, we can think about it in a vacuum. In a vacuum where there's no air resistance, a piece of paper and a bowling ball would really hit the ground at the same time because gravity pulls them at the same rate. So this is important thing number one. Um, important thing number two. So I'll, I'll mention here, actually, this means that they both have the same acceleration. Same acceleration. Good. OK. Uh, another experiment you can do which is actually more about this acceleration part here, to convince yourself that they really do accelerate as they move towards the ground. Imagine this. Imagine you have a ball falling down a slope and you wait some unit time. Um, so let me, let me write this here. Um, so you wait some unit time, let's say one second. Uh, if you wait one second when the ball is kind of at the top of the ramp, when it hasn't been moving for long, uh, you'll find that it will move a kind of a small distance D. Now, if you instead record how far the ball moves in one second towards the bottom of the ramp after it's been rolling for a while, you'll find that it'll have moved a larger distance. Uh, let's call it capital D. And what that says is it's moving faster further down the ramp than it was at the top. In other words, as it falls, its velocity is changing or it is accelerating. So uh, one thing you can do, you can watch a ball fall down a ramp, record the distances it travels in different time intervals and see um, that the ball accelerates as, oh, as it rolls down the ramp. Okay, so we've got two things going on. Things accelerate as they as they fall, and everything accelerates at the same rate. So we've got the conceptual stuff down. We're going to start putting some numbers in, and then when we do the questions, we'll do some proper actual uh, equations and so on, and do the maths part. So now we move between the conceptual bit and the maths bit. Uh, we need to define free fall. Can anyone define free fall for me? I'll tell you that when something is in free fall, we call it a projectile. But does anyone know what free fall is? Good, it's motion under gravity and only gravity. So an object is in free fall if it is accelerating. under gravity and only gravity. For instance, if you have to think about air resistance, you wouldn't call it free fall anymore because when you have free fall, uh, there is another acceleration. When you have air resistance, sorry, there's an acceleration not due to gravity. There's the kind of opposing acceleration due to the air resistance. OK, so free fall is like an assumption we make essentially to make the maths easier. Good. OK, uh, can anyone tell me what the acceleration of an object in free fall is? So we give it the symbol G usually. Good. It's 9.81, and what's the units there? Let me write that better. 9.81 meters per second squared. Perfect. OK, great. Let's have a go at a question. Nice. Um, a ball is thrown upwards with a speed 5 meters per second. Calculate the time taken for it to return to its starting position. OK, so what type of question is this? Well, I'm going to tell you that it's thrown upwards. So as soon as it leaves your hand, the only thing that's happening to it is it's accelerating under gravity. The acceleration under gravity is always this same number, 9.81. So 
what can you tell me about the acceleration? Well, it's constant. Because it's constant, we can use SUVAT. So this is a SUVAT question. S-U-V-A-T. OK, whenever you have a SUVAT question, you have to, uh, you're working between two different events at two different times. Um, and you want to try and fill in as many of these symbols about the situation as you can. So the ball is thrown upwards. So it starts below. It's thrown upwards with some five meters per second. Uh, and we're interested in the time it takes to return to its starting position. Okay, so what numbers do we know? Nice, displacement is zero. So first of all, we know the initial velocity, that's u, was five meters per second. I'm going to take upwards to be positive here. So yeah, the initial velocity is five meters per second. Um, Let's see, what else do we know? Yeah, so the defining kind of thing about this problem is it comes back to its starting position. So, I mean, if it was up here, you'd have some displacement S, but it's back to its starting position. So it's actually where it was to start with. The displacement is zero. Okay, we want to calculate the time. Um, what else do we know? Aha, so SUVAT is a set of equations about the displacement, the initial velocity, the final velocity, the acceleration, and the time interval between two points, um, between when you had this initial velocity and when you had this final velocity. Uh, and it's a set of equations that we're allowed to use. In particular, it's these equations here at the top. So I'll introduce them again as and when we see them. Uh, Okay, good. So let's have a go. So what equation can I use? Well, I've already seen it in the chat, so that's great. S equals ut plus a half a t squared. If I look at that, what do I know? Well, aha, so I should fill in the acceleration. The acceleration is minus 9.81. Upwards is positive, downwards acceleration. Okay, g coming downwards. Okay, so uh, we want to rearrange for the time. Let's let's have a go. Put in everything we know. S is zero. U is five. What else do we know? The time we don't know. We wish we knew that. Plus one half of minus 9.81 times T squared. Okay, so this says that zero... Um, let's try and solve this like this. This says that uh, one half, bring this to the other side, one half of 9.81 times t squared is equal to 5t. Um, now we could take out a factor of t here. Um, we could just divide both sides by t. When can we do that? Well, assuming t is not zero. Well, we don't think t is going to be zero because this thing is t is the time interval and it's gone up and come back down. Okay, so time is definitely not zero. 9.81 times t is equal to five. And in fact, that implies that t is equal to two times five over 9.81. And that we can chuck into a calculator and we should get 1.02 seconds. Cool. Okay, so I've seen um, I've seen this method in a couple of places, so that's great. It goes up and stops, comes up down. We consider u to be zero and then find v. So we can't consider u to be zero uh, because we know it's five at the start. Uh, v equals u plus a t. Yeah, it can be used. You're right. You have to kind of know that it's going to have the same downwards velocity as the upwards velocity it had at the start. You have to kind of, that's not clear. That's something you have to kind of know. But if you know that, you could have used V equals U plus AT. Good. Ah, so I always choose what direction is positive. And then I write, I draw a diagram where I show each of the accelerations and forces and velocities. And compared with the direction I've chosen, I can decide if they're positive or negative. We'll see a couple more examples of that as we go. Okay, so a conceptual question. 
A dart is thrown horizontally. Whenever you see a paragraph like this, it's nice to start drawing a picture straight away. A dart is thrown horizontally at a speed of eight meters per second towards the center of a dartboard. Okay, good. So, uh, yeah, here's my dartboard. Good. And it's got a center, which is going to matter later. Um, at the same instant that the dart is released, let's draw this a bit more like this. So the dart is thrown and it's thrown horizontally. Okay. So its initial vertical velocity is zero. At the same instant the dart is released, the support holding the dartboard fails and the dartboard falls freely. Freely means that only gravity acts on it, vertically downwards. Okay, so this dartboard is just falling downwards under gravity. The dartboard hit, the dart hits the dartboard in the center before they both reach the ground. So let's say the ground is down here somewhere. Um, the dartboard falls to, I don't know, to here, and the dart at the same time falls with it and hits the center of the dartboard apparently hits the center before they both hit the ground okay so state and explain the motion of the dart and the dartboard whilst the dart is in flight there's a bit of a weird question because you have to kind of try and figure out what the examiner actually wants you to explain if you look at this i think the thing that's kind of surprising that they want you to make a point of is the dart hits the dartboard in the center. Why on earth did it hit it in the center? So we wanna try and explain that. So can anyone explain to me why it hit the dartboard in the center? The dartboard, the dart was thrown directly at the center. And then at exactly that moment, the dartboard started falling. So what's, the, what's this question about? This is about a very important Good, they both have the same acceleration. They're objects in free fall, they have the same acceleration. So what that means is that because they fall at the same rate, then while the dart's coming towards the dartboard, they fall at the same rate. Let me do it like this. You throw the, you throw the dart and then they fall at the same rate. And so it's still gonna hit the dartboard in the center. Good, so let's, let's try and explain this in terms of some physical principles. Well, dart, and dartboard accelerate under gravity they both have the same acceleration G, so they fall at the same rate, they will always be the same distance from the ground. Since the dart started at the height of the center of the dartboard, it will still hit the center. So that was a whole four mark question. Exactly, it's just like the monkey hunter experiment. You're exactly right. So this is a four mark question, essentially about the fact that everything falls at the same rate when we have free fall. Perfect. Okay, so let's do some number stuff. And then we'll move on to projectiles. So figure 2.1 shows an arrangement used in the lab to determine the acceleration G of free fall. Okay. A steel ball is held at rest by an electromagnet. 
when the electromagnet is switched off, the electronic timer is started and the ball falls. Okay, here's the ball. Oh, there we go. Here's the ball. It's going to fall this distance. They tell us this next. The timer is stopped when the ball opens the trap door. There's a trap door. Distance between the bottom of the ball and the trap door is this much. Good. The timer records a timer fall this much. So we know a T and we know a displacement. Show the value for the acceleration of free fall explain, obtained from this experiment is 9.47. Good, you're absolutely right. This is going to be a SUVAT question. Um, we use SUVAT to try and figure out what the acceleration must have been. So we don't assume what the acceleration is here because we it's a show that the value of the acceleration is. Uh, and we should get this number. Okay, so let's write out SUVAT, S-U-V-A-T. Uh, we know T, 0 0.356. We know the displacement. Okay, now I need to choose a direction. So you asked before how I know whether each symbol is positive or negative. I get to choose a direction of positive. So I'm going to choose downwards as positive. Now, the displacement was downwards. It started higher, it finished lower. So the displacement is... 0.6, that is plus 0.6 meters. So I've chosen downwards as positive, just to kind of emphasize that I can choose what I want, as long as I define everything in terms of the direction I've chosen. So for example, before we had a negative acceleration because I chose upwards to be positive. This time I've chosen downwards to be positive. So the acceleration is just plus 9.81 because acceleration points down and down is positive. Okay, uh, the initial velocity. What's the initial velocity? We don't know the final one. Ah, sorry, 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 sorry. We're trying to figure out the acceleration. My bad. So we don't know this one here. We're going to figure that out. My apologies. <laughs> we know the initial velocity. Thank you. The initial velocity was zero because it was released from rest, held at rest. So now we want to figure out the acceleration. What equation can we use? Let's use S equals UT plus a half a T squared. Then what do we know? Well, U is zero, so UT is zero. What we're left with is this equation here, S equals a half a T squared. In other words, A is equal to, um, what have we got? We've got 2S over T squared which is equal to two times 0 0.6 over uh, t squared, 0 0.356 squared. And if you chuck that into a calculator, you should get around 9.47 meters per second squared. <laughs> Indeed, do that. Okay, so state one reason why the experimental value we got is less than what the acceleration due to gravity actually is. Why do we get a smaller acceleration? There's something wrong with this, right? Acceleration due to gravity is supposed to be 9.81. We got 9.47. What went wrong? Sweet. Good. So, here, really, this is the real world, and there isn't just except there isn't just gravity. What also is happening is it's having to go through a load of air particles. Each time it bumps into an air particle, the air particle kind of pushes back on a, on it a bit, gets in the way, uh, and so slows it down. So all we need to say here for our one mark is ball will experience air resistance. You may notice that's a very common answer for this sort of question. Okay, part three. On figure 2.2, .2, sketch a graph to show the variation of vertical distance uh, fallen by the ball with time t. Good, air resistance is drag. So the ball will not be totally free falling. Yeah, indeed, the answer is actually that it's not really free fall because there is an air resistance. Hmm. 
So I think the reason why we wouldn't say uncertainty is, well, I mean, it could have been, they could have really made an error, but they seem pretty confident because they gave all their numbers to three significant figures, which kind of says to me that they're very confident that there's a very low uncertainty. Okay, good. Yes. Yeah, so we know we start at a vertical position of 0 0.6 and we finish at this later time at a vertical position of zero. So does the graph look like this? That's A or like this? That's B. B. Yes, the answer is B. The reason is the gradient of this graph is velocity. Or if you like, you can see that early on, it should be moving slowly. Here, it's not very steep. Later on, it should be much steeper because it should be moving faster because it's been accelerating for a while. So we expect it to look like that. Okay. Uh, I actually can't remember what, um, I don't know what exam board it's from, uh, but I think it's a pretty universal question. Like this is concepts that you could be asked on for any exam board. Um, Okay, so part two is projectile motion. So now we're kind of, we're ramping everything up. We did everything in one dimension. Now we're dealing with things that fall, but in two dimensions. We had a hint of this with the dartboard thing, but now we're gonna do it with maths. So I wanna give you the kind of rough idea of what we're doing. Uh, the lesson goes till four. So here's the rough idea. If you're given a problem in two dimensions, like a ball that's been thrown kind of forwards and upwards at some kind of an angle in the air, that's what we're seeing here. It's moving up and down a bit, but it's moving left and right a bit. You can use SUVAT in each of the directions. So you can use SUVAT in the vertical direction. Uh, and you can use SUVAT in the horizontal direction. And finally, why on earth would this be useful? How are these two things related? Well, let's say I start off with some vertical position, some horizontal position, um, some initial and um, vertical and horizontal velocities. Um, and later on, I choose some, some other event that happened at some other time. The thing that links the two SUVAT equations I'll use is the time interval the time in your vertical SUVAT thing will be the same as the time in the horizontal equations. This will make maybe more sense as we do an example. So let's do an example. Um, I'm actually gonna change this question slightly. We're gonna take U to be the initial velocity, which we'll call U, which we've written in bold, um, to be four meters per second at 30 degrees to the horizontal. So apologies for that slight change. Okay, so here's the initial velocity. It got thrown upwards and to the right a bit. So it's kind of up at an angle like this. Here's our angle, the angle is 30 degrees and the length of this vector here is four. So that's what I mean by this. Here's our goal. Our goal is to go from this diagram, which doesn't look like it has much on it, Indeed, you completely ignore the other direction and then you go to using SUVAT in the other direction. It's always like a two-step thing. You get one piece of information from one SUVAT thing and then one piece of information from the other. Here's our goal. We're told that we throw at four meters per second at an angle of 30 degrees. We're told it lands three meters away in the horizontal direction. And our goal is to figure out how high we threw this from. Now, this is kind of magic. Like it really doesn't seem like we've been told much stuff, but we have been told enough to figure out how high we threw this ball from. We have to use a horizontal SUVAT thing first and then go to a vertical SUVAT. Okay, so let's use a horizontal SUVAT. So S-U-V-A-T. Here's the goal. I'm gonna figure out the time it took to get from here to here. This time interval here. And then I'll be able to use that in the vertical equations. So I want to figure out the time. This is going to be the link. Um, what's the acceleration in the horizontal direction? What's the initial velocity in the horizontal direction? And what's the displacement in the horizontal direction? We're not going to know this. Let's see. 
Good. So the acceleration is zero. Now that might seem a bit weird because we know there's an acceleration due to gravity, but let's draw a picture for the acceleration due to gravity on this object at any point. Is it in the horizontal direction? No, none of it is. It's all in the vertical direction. The horizontal acceleration is equal to zero. There's nothing pushing or pulling it in the horizontal direction. Good. Yeah, if there was air resistance, we'd have to dial this back. Good, so the acceleration is zero. The initial velocity in the horizontal direction is this component of the velocity. That's four cos 30. Good. And the, sorry, let me rub that out. Four cos 30, the displacement and the horizontal direction was three meters. Okay, so we use S equals UT plus a half a T squared. Uh, a is zero, so we can ignore this stuff. It's just S equals UT. We rearrange for T. T is equal to S over U, which is equal to three over four cos 30, which is equal to 0 0.866 seconds. So this is already pretty magic. We, it turns out we had enough information to know how long this ball was in flight for. Now we're going to use that to figure out H. So we know, let's change that to 30. One second. Um, okay, so the vertical motion now has acceleration G. This is where gravity comes in. It's acceleration G. Okay, so I get to make a choice here. I'm gonna choose upwards to be positive. Upwards is positive. And this is just kind of me making it harder for myself. Exactly, we know the time of flight between here and here is 0 0.8, what was it, 66 six seconds, because we already figured that out. What's the initial vertical velocity? We've got a U here at 30 degrees. So the horizontal velocity was U cos 30, the vertical velocity, this bit here, that's equal to u which is four for sine 30. Okay now I have to be careful I chose upwards to be positive and that velocity is upwards so I'll write it as positive. The acceleration points downwards with size 9.81. So what's the acceleration in the vertical direction? Is this a trick question? 9.81. It's a minus 9.81. Why? Because the acceleration points downwards and I've chosen upwards to be positive. So as a result, acceleration has to be negative. Good. Okay. And what about the displacement? Well, the displacement uh, is from here down to here. So that's also against the positive direction, it's minus h. So we'll be able to use the SUVAT equation and all of these numbers to figure out h, because h is something we don't actually know yet. We'll use s equals ut plus a half a t squared. Uh, we have minus h for s, we have four sine 30, um, times 0 0.866 uh, plus 1 over 2 of minus 9.81 uh, times t squared, so 0 0.866 squared. Okay, so times everything by minus 1 if we like, and we find that h is equal to 4 sine 30, uh, sorry, is equal to minus 4 sine 30 degrees times 0 0.866 uh, plus a half of 9.81 times 0 0.866 squared. And we can chuck that into a calculator and we should get around 1.9 meters. 
Okay, good. Good, I'm seeing a 1.95. So I think if you keep in the 0 0.866, maybe you get a 1.94. Um, so the only thing I ever have to choose is what direction is positive. So I can figure out whether each number is a plus or a minus. Everything else is then done for me. Okay, uh, how's everyone feeling about this? <laughs> Sweet. Nice. Okay. Um, yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Um, maybe things will also be clarified by doing a question ourselves. So always good to practice with some exam questions. This first one is kind of a funny one. Uh, so let's have a go. Figure three shows the path of a ball thrown horizontally from the top of a tower of height 24 meters. So again, we've got two directions going on here. Things are going left to right, things are going up and down. Okay, four or eight, using two labeled arrows, show on figure three, the direction of the velocity and the acceleration. Okay, what direction is the acceleration first? path of the ball it's thrown horizontally we haven't been told about any air resistance or anything so we're going to assume we don't have any air resistance so as a result the only thing that's really around is gravity and gravity always pulls us down towards the ground good now for the the velocity is just essentially the direction that the uh, that the ball is moving in that kind of tells you it's velocity, it tells you where it's going. So the velocity just points in the direction of the path. So this is something that you may not be used to. So this is kind of a new thing to learn, but the velocity, I should write this as an A, the velocity just points kind of in a tangent, i.e. in the direction of the path. The horizontal to the right. So which is so this is kind of what you said. It's it's it partly horizontal. Ah, I see, sorry, horizontal and downwards. Yeah. Ah, so here I haven't had to say whether things are positive or negative. I've just had to draw an arrow to show what direction it's in. Now, nothing's positive or negative yet until I choose a direction. If I chose upwards to be positive, then the acceleration would be negative. If I chose downwards to be positive, the acceleration would be positive. but that's my choice. I'm lucky. Uh, okay, next question. Calculate the time taken from when the ball is thrown to when it first hits the ground. Okay, assume that air resistance is negligible. So let's draw ourselves a little diagram again. Uh, 24 meters it starts from, 24, 24 meters, okay. Um, SUVAT, what direction should I use SUVAT in? Is this horizontal or vertical SUVAT? We, we, all we know is this vertical distance here. Yeah, so we don't really have much to go on. Uh, it's not clear, but let's let's have a go at figuring out the time using vertical SUVAT stuff. We know the displacement was 24. Uh, let me choose a direction for positive. Let me choose downwards to be positive. Then the displacement where it starts off up here, goes down here. So the displacement is like this, it's positive. So S equals 24, okay, U, V, A, T. We want to know T. Do we know A? A is downwards uh, with size 9.81. So that's plus 9.81. Um, what about U and V? V sounds hard to know. Do we know U? Do we know the initial vertical velocity? Do 
do we know its value? It's kind of hidden in the question. Yeah, so we do, but we haven't been told it like as a number. We have to try and figure it out from the first uh, from the first part of the question. Yeah, good. The part, the ball is thrown horizontally, so its velocity at the start is like this. Initially, it doesn't have a vertical velocity. It wasn't thrown up and it wasn't thrown down. It was just thrown across. So the initial vertical velocity is zero. And that really helps us out. Okay, so we use S equals UT plus a half AT squared. U is zero, so we can get rid of that bit. We want to figure out T. So S equals a half AT squared. So T is equal to the square root of 2S over A. And that's equal to the square root of 2 times 24 divided 9.81. And that in turn is equal to uh, roughly 2.2 seconds. Okay. The ball hits the ground at 27 meters from the base of the tower. Calculate the speed at which the ball is thrown. Oh, yeah, it's <laughs> I said like eight times out of ten, it's s equals ut plus half a t squared. <laughs> um, okay, so now this is a horizontal one. It, um, we're told 27 meters from the base, so we've got this bit here, but now we know this 27 meters. Okay, uh, calculate the speed at which the ball was thrown. So that's the initial velocity they want. S U V A T. We know T now because we figured it out here. It was 2.2. Acceleration in the um, horizontal direction was zero. So I'm doing see that in the horizontal direction here. Um, final velocity, don't know. Initial velocity, we wish we knew. Displacement, 27. Okay. So S equals UT plus a half AT squared. This time acceleration is zero, which means that we have S equals UT, U equals S over T, which is equal to 27 over 2.2, which is roughly equal to 12 meters per second. Okay, so you might be noticing a pattern examiners will often want you to do a vertical thing and then use the result that you got. The result is usually the time because the time is the thing you can use in the other SUVAT equation. So you'll figure out the time using one direction and then you'll use it in the other direction. Okay, so final part. Figure 1.1 shows the path of a ball that is thrown from point A to point B. The ball reaches its maximum height at point H. Good. Okay. The ball is thrown with initial velocity of 25 meters per second at 60 degrees to the horizontal. Assume that there is no air resistance. Show that the vertical component of the initial velocity is 21.7. Well, the vertical component is given by just finding how the vertical bit of this vector, which is, okay, 25 multiplied by sine of 60 here. So that's a nice mark for us to get. And that should be roughly equal to 21.7 meters per second. Okay, part two, calculate the time taken for the ball to reach point H. Okay, how can we do this? What, did, what do we know about H? Let's use S, let's use SUVA in the vertical direction. S-U-V-A-T. Um, we want to calculate the time taken. We know the acceleration. Let's choose upwards as positive. So then the acceleration is minus 9.81. What do we have here? Velocity would be zero at H. Good. It starts off just before H, it would be going upwards. Just after H, it would be going downwards. At H, the vertical velocity is zero. It's not going up and it's not going down. Um, really nice. Okay, so we know the initial velocity in the vertical direction because we calculated it here. So that's 21.7. Um, we know the final velocity is zero 
We don't know this. Okay, so finally we get to use a different equation. Uh, you'll be glad to hear. Let's use V equals U plus AT, because this time we actually didn't know S, so we have to work with something else. Okay, so then T is equal to V minus U over A, uh, which is going to be minus 21.7 divided by minus 9.81. Notice the, the minus signs cancel out, which is nice. And we just get 2.21 seconds. Good. Okay. Finally, part three, last question. Calculate the displacement from A to B. Aha, fancy pen. <laughs> Okay, so there, there's a couple of ways of doing this. Um, let's use the fact, okay, if it takes a certain time to get to here, and that time is 2.21 seconds, then how long does it get to here? How long does it take to get to here? Well, it's, it's, you can kind of work this out fully if you'd like, but this is really, it's, it's going to work out to be the same time again. Good, you double the time for the whole flight. To get halfway, you double it to get all the way, good. So the time taken is equal to two times 2.21. Now let's use SUVA in the horizontal direction. What do we have there? We have S-U-V-A-T in the horizontal direction. The acceleration is zero. The time is now this thing here, which is 4.21. Uh, four, two, good, okay. Uh, we want to calculate the displacement, fine. And we know the initial horizontal velocity because that would be this bit here, 25 cos 60. Okay, so U is 25 cos 60, good. And then we'll use S equals UT plus a half A T squared. A is zero, so we can get rid of that. We just get S is equal to 25 cos 60 multiplied by 4.42. And that should give you around 55.2 meters. Good. Okay, so we covered, we covered quite a lot there. Um, you should understand how to deal with free fall. Uh, you should be able to do some conceptual stuff with gravity. Um, and you should be able to turn this into dealing with 2D problems. Um, the acceleration was minus just because I chose upwards to be positive and the acceleration was downwards. No worries. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're going to stick around till the end and I can get you a uh, coupon code. Um, so I'll just do that now, actually. And let me know in the meantime if you have any questions. And I'll just give you a quick run through of the Snap Revised website so you can see what you would be getting a coupon for. Uh, okay. So I'm just going to stop my share very briefly. Uh, put this over to here. There we go. Okay, good. So hopefully you can all see my screen. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Um, and yeah, it'd be really nice just to quickly show you what we're doing over at the Snap Revised website to see if you fancy using a coupon code to take a look at a bit more. Yeah. So I'm currently logged into my account. I'm lucky enough to have a few courses. I'm lucky enough to have the ultimate ones. Um, let's take a look at physics. Why not? Let's look at edXL. So the idea of the course here, um, let me just bring us through, uh, is essentially we're calling it smart adaptive learning. So here's the idea. Um, you can do a quiz. And a quiz can tell you, uh, in general, you could do a quiz and a quiz would tell you how well you got on. Um, it might give you some kind of hint. 
as to as to what things you need to study. That's the use of tests. Well, imagine if you had a course which molded itself depending on how you got on on the quizzes and on the exams. So at the start of any course, whenever I say I want to learn a new thing, I can take a diagnostic test. So let's talk about, let's look at, huh, we got a projectile motion one. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay, so if we look at projectile motion, we have a chance to do a diagnostic quiz at the start. And the course, oh no, I skipped it. Ah, oh, can I go back? Yeah, start now, sweet. Um, once I get through the quiz, it will give me some hints. It will actually mold the course and take me straight to the bits of the course that I need to learn. So, okay. I'm not going to figure this out. What was the time difference between them hitting the ground? That sounds like a zero. That's a Galileo thing. Uh, let's get a couple wrong. I hope I get them wrong. Yeah, I'm going to get them wrong. Okay. Let's see how we, how we get on. What I want you to see is what happens at the end here. Okay, I've got 17%, so not, not my best showing. Um, here's what I know and what I don't know, and here's the cool bit. So now if I go into the course, um, the videos that I need to watch are highlighted in orange. Luckily, <laughs> in this case, it's everything because I only got 17%. But I did get one question right, and that means that I don't need to look at introduction to projectiles. So if what you want to do is try and like streamline your learning so that you're only focusing on the bits that you need to know, it's easy to spend a lot of time going over the things you know, but that's just that's just time you could be doing something else, <laughs> either learning things you don't know or just you know having fun. So um, you go into these videos and you can just skip straight to the stuff that has been flagged as the stuff that you need to learn. At the end of each section, there's a there's a new quiz that you can try that will kind of reevaluate all this. And there are some exam questions uh, that we've modeled ourselves. Uh, so some kind of mock exam questions that we take you through. And just like we did kind of today, we take you through how we would think about the question if we were solving them. Um, okay, so we think this is a super useful resource. Um, and I hope it is useful. I hope it is useful for you. Study smart, not hard. Exactly. <laughs> this is this is why we call it smart adaptive learning. <laughs> Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. Go back. Uh, view my courses, add courses. Sorry, just one second. There we go. Okay. Bad, one second. Okay, so we have a couple of different plans. Um, there's a there's a there's a plan where you have access to the courses. Uh, there is a plan where you have access to um, not only the courses but the smart adaptive part and some of our exam packs. Um, so in the smart adaptive part, you have the course that kind of mold, molds around you. So that's the, the our kind of our second price plan. And then our third price plan, if you really like these web classes and you want to do more interactive sessions like that, uh, then yeah, you can sign up for our highest price plan. And um, I'm doing quite a few sessions a week. Someone else is also doing quite uh, a couple of sessions a week at the moment. Um, a couple where we go through web classes like this, um, things that we think are worth going through. Um, and a couple which are just drop-in sessions. So with drop-in sessions, you can just... Um, you can just come in with questions that you want to go through that you're confused about and you can ask us about them and then we'll take you through. Good. Okay. So thanks very much everyone for coming. I've got to head off now to do a web class. Um, so I'll do that now. Um, and I'll just give you the, uh, the coupon code so that you can go. Um, thanks very much for coming everyone. Okay, so there's the screen. Good, here's the up upcoming classes and here's the code for today, PM10. Perfect, so thanks very much everyone for coming and uh, hopefully see, see some of you in the future. Cheers, bye.